Well, good morning and good evening, wherever you are in the world. And I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. Welcome to the 10th episode of the Voices of Sustainability virtual fireside chat series. I'm Christina Skerka, CEO of Power for All, a global campaign to accelerate the end of energy poverty and advance decentralized renewable energy as the best solution to universal energy access. So first, a little bit about the Zayed Sustainability Prize, which I have a personal relationship to. Uh, the Zayed Sustainability Prize was established in 2008 as the UAE's pioneering global award for recognizing organizations and global high schools for their sustainable, innovative humanitarian solutions. Today, the prize counts 14 years of global impact with 370 million people around the world benefiting from its winners solutions across the categories of health, food, energy, water, and global high schools. Just a little tidbit, uh, I used to work with Delight uh, and it was actually in 2013 when we applied for the Zaya Future Energy Prize. And it was with those funds that Power for All was first started back in 2014. So this is very near and dear to my heart and I'm pleased to be here today. But before I go on to introduce our guest speakers, I'd like to first set the scene for today's episode. So when we talk about gender equality in the decade of action, there are actually two different dimensions to consider. So one is about safeguarding basic human rights for women across socioeconomic environments, which is not to be taken for granted. And one about enabling conditions for female leaders to break the glass ceiling within the sector. This will be the focus of today's discussion, and while we will additionally examine if and how climate change affects women disproportionately, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, then the distinct role of women can play in accelerating climate action will also be part of the discussion. So now let me introduce our guests. First, Christine Linz, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Global Win Women's Network for the Energy Transition, or GWNet. Before founding GWNet, she headed the Renewable Policy Network, REN21, a Power for All partner, and previously the European Renewable Energy Council. Her professional journey over the last 25 years has been to advance the energy transition with renewables and energy efficiency, beginning at regional levels in her home country of Austria, and then expanding to the European and global levels. And Mohammed Nasiri is the Regional Director for Asia and Pacific at UN Women, which is the United Nations organization's uh, program that's focused on policies and standards that uphold women's rights and ensure that every woman and girl lives up to her full potential. He has extensive experience in gender, human rights, and development issues across Asia and the Pacific, as well as Arab states, and also serves as the Special Advisor to the Executive Director. So welcome to you both. Wonderful to connect. Thank you, welcome. Yes, great to have you both. So um, to begin today's episode, let's start by setting a foundation for the discussion. And I'd like to ask both of you to tell us why gender equality is really key to sustainable development. Uh, first to you, Christine. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Christina. Thanks for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Um, I think the gender equality is absolutely key because when we look at figures, we have uh, today, according to uh, the latest uh, um, uh, estimates from IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, about 12 million people working in the renewables field. Uh, we have uh, to work together with IRENA on a study called Renewable Energy Agenda Perspective. Uh, which showcased that um, the share of women in renewables is with 32% higher than the share of women in oil and gas, where it's only 22%. But when we now hear that these 12 million today should be uh, 42 million in 2050, if this energy transition really continues in, in its full swing, then it's absolutely clear that we will only, uh, or this industry will only achieve this if it manages to attract the best talents of both women and men. And that's why uh, an organization such as DWNet is really working hard and committed to uh, empowering women in this space, but also to increasing the share of women uh, in the energy transition, because we are of the opinion that the transition would be uh, more just, of course, but we also think it would be quicker and more equitable, and, and that's what we work for. 
Thanks for that. Mohammed, what would you like to add to the topic about why gender equality is so important to sustainable development? I think Christine said it all. Um, it, simply put, because it's not only the right thing to do, but it's also the smart and the more logical thing to do. If we're going to alienate half of the population of humanity from um, inputting and bringing into the, the space ideas, uh, positions, perspectives um, into sustainable development solutions, then we're definitely missing on a lot. Um, we, we need not only to understand the differentiated impact um, and needs of um, the women and girls uh, with regards to development, but also we need to get their agency and their voice because there is a huge complementarity and richness in that space when everyone comes on board and inputs. Thanks for that. Um, so now, Christine, back over to you. So you've obviously had a number of really prestigious leadership roles in the renewables energy sector. And, and I'm curious in your personal experience, uh, do you think in any way it's made it more difficult for you to get those roles uh, as a female? Um, and I'm just curious if you could also tell us a little bit about the challenges women face in the sector, both in general and at a management level. Well, um, I'll start with uh, the second part of the question. Uh, I think uh, very often uh, women face uh, the perception that uh, that these are jobs that are more suitable for men uh, because the energy sector as such is, is, is considered as a very technical sector. Uh, and, and we still have a lot to do to attract uh, women and girls uh, to, to, to STEM uh, subjects uh, being it in high school or also at, at university. So I think there is this uh, need for just, uh, you know, providing role models because we hear a lot in our work that uh, that women lack role models uh, of women having, uh, you know, gone up uh, the career ladder. And, and I think those of us who have achieved this should really uh, or are invited to share their experiences and, and to share their case studies because that is serving as an expire, in inspiring example. Um, I think, uh, and then we are working also uh, a lot on demonstrating that uh, the, the jobs in energy are not only technical jobs, they are, we are, they are also, uh, you know, um, uh, salespeople, journalists, uh, political scientists needed all different kinds of, uh, of subjects, and there is, there is something in there for, for just about uh, anybody. I would say that uh, myself in my career, I was lucky. I had a lot of uh, mentors, both men and, and women. And, and I, I can really uh, testify that mentorship is something powerful to help you, you know, uh, discuss uh, things that you have in your head uh, and, and plans to, to advance your career. And, um, and that's why we also at GW are running a lot of mentoring programs. We really believe in this, uh, in this uh, element of empowering people to, to take uh, the career to the next level. I personally don't think that it was uh, it was more difficult. I would say I was I was rather lucky because very early on in my my career I am I studied economics uh, at university, so I'm uh, and I'm, I'm an economist, and I very early on happened to uh, to put the foot in the in the sustainable energy sector, and I found my passion. And this is my recommendation to just about anybody. You know, whatever you do. Uh, you are you're just much better at it if you really can put all your heart in it. You will spend a lot of time in your job. So uh, find, try to find what you what you really burn for, so to say. And that is sustainability. Uh, that is that is energy. I was lucky, you know. I, I started uh, in this industry back in the 90s when this was really in its infant stage and it was mainly considered as something nice to have from the environmental perspective. And I've just witnessed this tremendous growth uh, of the renewable sector from uh, a niche into a, a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, which now provides solutions for not only the rich OECD countries, but also uh, the emerging economies and the, and the developing countries. And, and this is, was, was a very fascinating um, development to witness. And, and I think um, that gave me kind of the energy uh, to really, you know, uh, go, go on. And then the other thing is what, what I found uh, as very beneficial is that uh, you have to seize the opportunity when it uh, presents itself to you. 
Okay, well, thanks for that. And I mean, one thing that we do know is that there's definitely more women involved in the renewables energy sector than in traditional oil and gas. Um, and that's fantastic. There's plenty of studies out there. Power for All has its own power and job study that talks about this, but yet there's more to be done. Um, and specifically, there's lots of industries that are needed for the sustainable transition. It's not just the energy generators themselves. So you've spoken a lot about mentorship. Um, I'm just wondering what else you would say we need to look at to enable more women in those sort of adjacent sectors needed for a just transition to, to clean energy globally. What else can we do to address these challenges? Well, as I said, I think we need to start early on in, in edu the education system to, to develop curricula uh, that, that really also focus on these subjects. We have to um, demonstrate all the opportunities uh, that are out there. And of course, it's important that like any industry, I mean, I think uh, I've recently read an article which says we are moving away from an uh, employer to an employee market. So there, the people can really choose the jobs they want. And, and it's important that companies put in place uh, uh, company policies that are compatible, that, uh, that, 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 that place work-life balance uh, at the core, that uh, we have a situation still in many parts of the world where women uh, do the majority of the carers jobs, uh, be it for the elderly or be it for the children. And this has to be accommodated. And uh, we, we, we see that uh, there is a need for flexible uh, work conditions uh, for paid maternity leave for, for all these different kinds of things. And in that, in that sense, I think the energy sector is, is not different from many other sectors. Uh, we have done a couple of years ago, a study where, where initially we thought we look at the different sectors uh, to maybe uh, draw some lessons, which we, which we can integrate into, um, into the energy sector as recommendations on how to advance uh, the careers of women. But we found that it's very similar. When, it, when you look uh, as the women move up the career ladder, you see that the share of, uh, of, of, uh, of women in, in leadership positions is declining. So I think for this also, it is needed to have quota, uh, to have uh, policies in place that really encourage uh, more female leadership. And then what we see is very often when women are the ones recruiting others, uh, and there are lots of examples and guides for good practice, uh, gender sensitive uh, recruitment policies, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, they are likely to recruit more women uh, than, than their male counterparts. So I think uh, slowly the, the whole system is changing, but I think what we need um, is an accelerator. And, and, and I think uh, it is, it is, the industry is really advised to, to, to work on this because it's gonna be uh, a competition for the best talents. And as, uh, as, uh, as, as we have said before, we can't leave out half of the population. This would be definitely in the disadvantage of, uh, of the whole industry sector. Yeah, those are some great insights, Christine. Thank you. I know uh, at Power for All, where we're largely female-led uh, and run, um, we also have a stance against mantles. <laughs> we, we really support getting at least two women on every panel like this. So hats off to uh, the team <laughs> at the Zion Sustainability Prize for uh, already heading in that direction. Um, so, Mohammed, um, you work a lot in the Asian Pacific region, um, and obviously we know that there's already a, a fair amount of ethics uh, on, related to climate change that are threatening li livelihoods and human life. Um, and it's a disproportionate effect in terms of the countries that created this problem in the first place. Um, but there's also discussion that women are disproportionately affected in these countries. Can you talk a little bit about how that is? Absolutely. And um, as you said, uh, Christina, around 45% of the natural disasters that are happening in the world are happening in um, the Asia Pacific region. And almost 75% of the global population that is affected by that resides in this region. Um, women are disproportionately affected and um, in, in so many ways, uh, the livelihoods, many of the women in the region are um, very strongly dependent on uh, informal sector economies. This is where they work. And those um, spaces are very much attached and affected by the climate change, whether they are um, working in the aquaculture, in the agriculture, in uh, fishing, um, and with, with climate 
their livelihoods are severely affected. In addition to that, um, there is an issue also of safety and security there where you do find many of the populations where water is becoming a scarcity, you do find that the women and girls are the ones who are responsible to leave their own domicile, whether it was their own village or town and, and walk for miles to fetch water and come back. And that space um, makes them more vulnerable to uh, violence that is exerted on them uh, in so many ways. So the, the effects are definitely uh, large and, and many. And this is why one of the reasons um, that we need to look into the voice and agency of women when we come and, and look for uh, mitigation um, and uh, solutions for climate change. Well, and on that, um, what mechanisms are there or what can be put into place to protect women against climate change in these settings? I, I believe the first thing is to uh, facilitate spaces where they have the agency and the voice to participate because we cannot continue to work on behalf of women or to uh, assume what is it that they need. Um, and that's why I, I believe it's very important uh, going back to what Christine was saying, looking into quotas, looking into affirmative action by which women are sitting in spaces where they are decision uh, takers and makers uh, when it comes to climate mitigation and, and uh, action. Um, when we look into national committees uh, around the world, we need to have women there. When we look into uh, private sector entities that are working on renewable energies, as you rightly said, Christine, we need to have women there. So these are very important mechanisms that we need to put in place to ensure that they have the space, the agency, um, and the power of voice. Well said. Um, and, and Christine, back to you. There's, there's obviously, um, some would say, a contradiction around gender and sustainable development, that women are often the most vulnerable, but at the same time, women and girls are often uh, mobilized as effective leaders for development and climate adaptation and mitigation. So from a policy perspective, what adjustments are needed to ensure women and girls are not left behind in the transition? Well, I think... Um... Uh, as as Mohammed has said, uh, is it, very right. They need to say to have a seat at the table and and make and be part of the decision making. And I was I remember at last International Women's Day, I was on a panel and somebody said, well, you know, if you don't have a a, a seat on the table, create your own table. Uh, I know that this is easier said for some of us, uh, but I think uh, we can encourage people to really stand up and. Uh, uh, and and voice their opinion and uh, and I think that also women in in more senior positions can encourage the younger generations to to follow suit, encourage them to ask questions in panel discussions, to really uh, come on board and, and and be active. And I think in in one of our studies, what we have found out is, and I think this is very interesting and also could be convincing to many that companies with diverse leadership have better economic results. Uh, because they often have more stringent uh, decarbonization policies, they have less, uh, they are less subject to to taking risk because they they weigh in uh, the different settings. They are more open to to sustainability considerations, and and I think we have to move away from this. It's just nice to have. It is an economic imperative, and and it is not only nice to have, but it's really also beneficial for uh, for the results of the company. And it is also necessary that, of course, governments and, and institutions are held accountable uh, for their share. And, uh, and, and we believe a lot in the power of the example by spreading uh, good practices from the sector. Uh, I think that that helps uh, many other organizations then uh, to to go in that direction and uh, and take up uh, inclusive uh, policies. Thanks for that. Uh, Mohammed, a, a question for you. Um, 
Look, obviously COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone, everyone differently and similarly in, in the same time. Um, but obviously women have really suffered, um, oftentimes having to leave the workforce to, as Christine was mentioning early, you know, manage caretaking responsibilities at home. So I'm curious if you could summarize from us what you think the COVID-19 pandemic has done to slow down progress and are, is there anything being discussed in these recovery plans uh, to help level set that change? It didn't only slow down progress. It did hold progress in many parts of the world. And in even sometimes it, it did cause regression uh, on, on all fronts, Christina. Uh, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations have called it the shadow pandemic because um, uh, the violence against women, because you have so many women and girls um, during the pandemic and the lockdowns have been uh, locked down in the same space with their own abusers. So you had um, the violence against women rates uh, skyrocketing in many parts of the world. But in addition to that, and as you rightly said, uh, whether we like it or not, unfortunately, most of the home care responsibilities have been offloaded on the shoulders of women and many girls uh, becoming uh, caretakers, not only for their children, but for their extended families, the elderly, and many of the mothers have turned into homeschooling teachers. And that has uh, indeed affected their, uh, their work outside the house. Um, many had to leave and many added to their burden uh, and that has affected their own mental health and well-being. Um, and many of the women who have worked in the informal sector, in um, uh, economic sectors that are highly elastic, um, have been affected and hit hard by the pandemic. But in addition to that, you do find a direct correlation between the pandemic and the increase of misogynistic messages against women and bullying uh, of women on the internet and in the virtual space. You have a direct correlation between the pandemic and incre increased violent, violent extremism, um, and also between the pandemic and conflict. And, and again, women and girls are paying the price disproportionately. Um, coming back to solutions or looking forward with um, how are we going to build back more equal and better, it brings us back to what Christine and I have been saying all along, that we need to have women on the table. So more than 70% of the healthcare workers and the frontline workers of the pandemic were women. But when we came to look for solutions and moving forward, they are nowhere to be found. It's there's still the, the minority there uh, on any task forces, on any committees, uh, on any national planning spaces for the day after COVID and the post-COVID era. So we need to have the voices of women there. We need to continue to push as the international community to ask for women on the table. Yeah, well said. And, uh, you know, just to switch a little bit more uh, the conversation to safeguarding women uh, against the issues of climate change. Um, you know, I do think there probably is some role for innovations happening, whether they're policy innovations or technology innovations. Um, and there's some basic statistics out there that might really inform an interesting way to look at this. So, you know, for example, on the continent of Africa, we know that easily 60 to 70% of populations are farmers. What most people don't know is that a lot of those farmers are women. And so I'm just curious, you know, raising the, the sort of specter of how climate disproportionately affects developing countries, as well as women, what innovations are you two aware of that may make a real difference, not just into building back better, but building forward? How are we gonna be safeguarding women from the effects of climate change based on some innovations you two might be aware of? Yeah, if I if I may start, uh, and by no way is am I going to be exhaustive. Uh, I think we need uh, we, we need to get 
things right in the in the policy space because uh, when it comes to energy transition uh, as you have mentioned there are lots of technologies out there we are not talking about one single source of energy but a bundle of energy that is uh, differently available in different parts of the world and uh, and and, and uh, so we can't and our generation can't say anymore that we didn't have the technologies at hand i think they are there uh, i think we need to get uh, the, the the political framework right because we still see that there is not a level playing field uh, uh, in the energy sector. There, there's there's not there's uh, you know there are very heavy fossil fuel subsidies. There is a lot of that that needs to be um, you know the, the picture needs to take into account a lot of different elements. And so I think it is very important that governments. Uh, are really setting uh, the the tone for in which direction they want the energy sector to go, taking into account, of course, the entire population and 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 how they will be affected uh, uh, on it. Um, and so, uh, getting the policy right and also getting the long-term policy framework right uh, by including, uh, of course, uh, as Mohammed has rightly said, not only. Uh, male perspectives, but also female ones, uh, is is a key denominator. Uh, I would say because it it has a lot of then uh, impact on the industry will follow suit, uh, jobs will be created that will again be beneficial for for the population, and uh, and and this is absolutely necessary. We do also see uh, in in this whole transition that there are lots of examples uh, of uh, women-led cooperatives uh, really, you know, showing the way. Uh, we have these examples where we see that women take an active stance uh, in in this transition, uh, and uh, and uh, and we can definitely learn uh, from them. So just a couple of of things which I think are uh, absolutely crucial. Um, I'm I'm very optimistic that that we are heading in the right direction, but it will take an it will not be business as usual that gets us there, uh, because we know that. Uh, reaching the, the goals of the Paris Agreement means nothing uh, less than completely decarbonizing the energy sector by, by 2050 at the latest. So there is a lot at stake. Uh, and, uh, and I think what makes it more complex is that we don't have one energy transition, but uh, it's uh, every country uh, embarks on, on, on a transition that is taking into account the natural resources and the background from where they come from. And, uh, but it needs really visionary leadership uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to guide the ship in the direction it, it should be headed to. Mohammed, anything you'd like to add to that? Absolutely. I think in addition to that, I think we need also in addition to the policy and, and the te uh, technological innovation, we need to look into legal innovation. We need to see how can we think of innovative ways to mainstream the voice of women uh, into the different policies and the different spaces uh, through the legal lens. In addition to that, I think we also need to um, think of innovation not only as the high tech, but also community based solutions, uh, community community based uh, ideas that can be um, innovative and but also respond to the local uh, needs and the context on the ground. Yeah, well said. And uh, what I will say is there are some incredible examples uh, from a legal perspective of countries such as Mexico making firm commitments about having women in leadership positions. Um, so there's models out there to replicate and expand on. Um, so just a final question for you both. Uh, the, the question put in front of me to ask the two of you experts was in one word, how would you describe the future of sustainability? Exciting. Equal. Wow, okay. <laughs> well, thank you both so much uh, for joining us today and for sharing your valuable insights. And thank you for the audience uh, to tuning in. And if you'd like to watch the entire session, it will be available and posted on the Prizes YouTube channel. So until next time, thank you.